All right, so as I mentioned during announcements, this sermon this morning is going to be a sermon, you know, kind of holding in regard our mothers, and today's Mother's Day, and I don't normally just tie in all, you know, secular holidays to church and to the Bible, but I do think it's very good to have a day, even though you're not going to find Mother's Day in Scripture. There's nothing wrong with honoring and taking a day aside to respect and give credit and honor unto women and especially unto, unto mothers for the, for the role and the job that they do in raising and rearing children. It is a very difficult job. It's a very hard job. We're going to get into a lot of that as we go this morning. But it, and unfortunately, in our culture today, it's almost as if, you know, motherhood is disdained. It's looked down upon. It's like it's not that valuable anymore because what is the feminist movement doing? They're trying to put all the moms into the workforce. They're trying to get moms to, to leave home, leave your children, go put your children off to be cared for by somebody else, let other people raise your kids, and you just go off and work and just make more money as if that's what life is all about. But you know what? That's what this world is going to tell you life's all about, but that's not what God's word says that life's all about. Not even close. We care about our mothers because we know what truly is important. And people are way, way, way more important than any financial benefits or any type of substance that you can get in this world. People. It's about, it's about our children. It's about the future. It's about the truth. It's about God's word. That is way more important than anything that you can receive from just getting a job. Now, I'm going to get this out of the way at the beginning to look, I understand there's, there may be people listening to this, people in different situations, and I'm not saying that the truth is different based on different situations, but we live in a fallen and a sinful world. What I'm going to be preaching this morning is God's ideal perfect plan. Okay, God's, you know, the ideal is you're going to have a husband and a wife And, you know, raising a family, when it comes to a family structure, not everybody has, you know, there's divorces, there's deaths, there's other things that happen, right? So people end up in different situations and have to do what you have to do to get by. I get that. So when I teach that, you know, women, as the Bible, I'll show you from the Bible, are to be keepers at home, discreet, chaste, you know, these are things that the Bible says that, that women ought to be. They ought to be, you know, if you have children, raising your children and staying at home, that's because the husband is supposed to be off working and providing for the family. And that is the structure that God has given us through his word. And again, in today's society, I know that, that may sound crazy to some people, but it's really not crazy. It's actually the way things used to be in this country and in many other places and the way it has been historically because it works, because it's true, because it's right. And we'll see, we'll, we'll, we're going to get into that a little bit. Just give me some time. We'll look at scripture. We're going to see and let God's word tell us how things ought to be. But as I go through this, don't, you know, I, I don't want you getting, you know, people getting super upset, you know, I know there's, there's, you know, sometimes sinful things happen, sometimes other things happen outside your control. You may not be in the same situation, but it doesn't change this truth. It doesn't change what we're, what we're striving for. It doesn't change our goal. And you know what? People aren't in, you know, people are all in different points in their life, maybe made mistakes in their life. Like, I've made plenty of mistakes in my life too. But we want to know how we could move forward from that and, and try to get more right with God. So, so we started in Proverbs chapter 6, and look at verse number 20. We're going to get back to Proverbs also a little bit later in the sermon. But I want to focus in on verse number 20. The Bible says, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. We're going to see multiple other passages in Proverbs. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And you see, especially in the beginning chapters of Proverbs, my son, my son, and, and the, the wisdom is being directed to a child, to a son, and, and all of this great wisdom. The, the, the book of Proverbs has real, very, you know, very good real life applications. You know, stay away from the strange woman. We saw that in this chapter. 
you know, stay away from people who are greedy and looking for gain and that are, that are you know, willing to hurt other people. There's so many basic, simple truths that are extremely important for us to live a good life, a good righteous life, are found in this book. And it's being directed towards children, towards a child or towards a son. And in verse 20, he says, My son, keep thy father's commandment. Forsake not the law of thy mother. What I must focus on here is the law of thy mother. Now, we're going to get into the family structure in just a minute, but, um, and actually turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 in the New Testament. And then we're going to look at Hebrew, or, not Hebrews, Ephesians chapter 5. Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5 are, are you know, called parallel passages. They cover basically the same things. But um, I'm going to show you how the Bible teaches that the structure of the family, there's, there's certain powers that God has ordained among men, among humans, just among his creation. There is the structure, or the organization of human civil government. God has ordained there to be certain powers that men can hold in positions to have authority over other people in order to judge and provide sentencing for crimes, right? So normally I don't have the ability to just go and kill someone else or to give someone a beating, or to take money away from them. I don't have that right. I don't have that power. God instituted human government to have the power, though, in order to have justice, in order to provide to right things that are wrong. So when someone else steals, God is now given the authority to exact, okay, that person that stole, when they're found guilty, they have to restore sevenfold. Right? That's what, again, we saw that in Proverbs as well. They have to restore sevenfold. So normally you can't just make someone or you just have to pay someone. But God has given that power and that authority unto human government to be able to provide for that. You know, the death penalty when it's necessary, a beating when it's necessary, whatever God's judgments are. He says, this is the way it needs to be and I am providing you now with this authority and this power to do that. So he's made that structure. He's also given a structure or power structure within the church within serving God, where he puts Christ at the head and you have bishops and you have people in the church. You know, there's, there's a whole authority chain or structure of the way things are going. Now, government sometimes will overstep its boundaries and get into things that it doesn't have God-given authority to get into. And when that happens, we are not obligated to submit to that authority. But we do have to submit to the authority that God has given to the government. You do have to submit to the authority that God has given to church or to people in the role of church. And you do have to submit to the roles that God has given within the family. And these are all their own realms, if you will, their own kingdoms, whatever you want to call it. Their, their own sphere of, of uh, influence or of authority. And a perfect example would be, you know, within the church... I don't have the role of, of getting into someone's family business. So I can't tell someone else's wife or, you know, like, and that's even just within families. Anyways, regardless of being a pastor of a church, no one has the authority, no husband has the authority to tell someone else's wife what to do, right? You're in charge of your whole household and that's it. That's where your scope ends. It's within your family. It's within your household. Other people, they have their own structure within their household, Okay. You can't cross over and start managing other people's stuff. That's not the way God decided. Same thing with church. I can't just talk to these other churches around here and be like, well, hey, I'm a pastor, so you need to do things this way. And you, you know, no, that's their church. They have their own structure, and they're responsible unto Christ, just like I am responsible to Christ. So we have to keep this in mind, because, and I'm going somewhere with this, so just stay with me. Um, Colossians chapter 3 gives a brief summary of husbands and wives' roles within a marriage. So in verse number 18, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So we see the wife is supposed to submit to the husband, the husband, which, which puts the husband in charge, by the way. If the wife is submitting, the husband's at the head. The husband's in charge. 
And the husband is supposed to love their wives and, you know, and, and do things for them. And, and we'll see in Ephesians 5, he's supposed to love the wives as lo Christ loves the church and be able to give your life for them. You know, it's a great love there. And then children, now children have to obey your parents. It doesn't say obey your mom. It doesn't say obey your dad. It says your parents. That's your mom and dad. You obey both. And the reason why I'm going in this is in Proverbs 6.20, it says the law of thy mother. So an issue that some people may have, some families may have is, you know, you have a, a, a wife, you have a mom at home. She's trying to be godly. She's trying to do what's right. And she can see something here and say, well, hey, that's the law of thy mother. Mom should have laws. She should have rules at home for her children. You need to have boundaries. You have to, you know, a structure set up. You have to have laws. The kids need to know you can't do this. You know, and mom is going to be the one that should be raising those children and spending the most time with them and bringing them up. Because, as I mentioned, you know, dad's going to be off at work. So he can't be around the children nearly as much as mom is going to be. So mom has a very critical role in the rearing of the children because she's going to be there way more often, which means that she has to have rules. She has to have laws. Now, what I think happens sometimes is because there is an authority structure and the husband's in charge, dad is ultimately the one who has the most authority within the house uh, just next to God, right? God obviously has supreme authority in every instance, in every matter, in everything that is created, whether it be government, whether it be family, whether it be church, God is at the top of everything. But there has to be then something that happens when, you know, mom is instituting a law, but then what if dad says something different? Right? Well, when dad says something different, who's the authority? You have to revert to who the authority is. And that's why the Bible says, you know, wives, submit yourselves to your own husband. So when, when that's the case, you need to go with what the father says. But I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 because Colossians 3 is a very, very simple um, outline. Wives submit your husbands. Husbands love your wives. Children obey your parents. You obey mom and dad. But it's very important for the structure to be clear within the household if you want things to run optimally. God knows what's best. So we need to have faith to just saying, well, if God said it, then you know, even I don't understand it. Because you have, you have a lot of wives that might say, well, yeah, but I know more than my husband. You know, he makes bad decisions, right? So we should just do things my way. We just, we just need to, you know, this is, this is the way things need to be done. And, and you end up getting in, in, in fights and arguments. And actually the family's not going to be as strong when, when you're not falling into your God-given role. God didn't say, well, the husband's in charge unless the wife is smarter or un unless he, he's, you know, not a good leader. Maybe, maybe the wife's a better leader. He, he doesn't give these stipulations. He just says, this is the way it is. And this is, this is a blanket statement. This is the same truth for everybody. There are no caveats here. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, that's a lot of authority given to the husbands, saying, you know, the way that you would submit to God is the submission to your husband. Now, this, is a, this could be a hard pill to swallow these days because this is contrary to everything that's being taught out in the world. And even in, even in families, even in people in Christian homes, this isn't being taught anymore. It's sad and it's destroying the family. And then we wonder why is there such a high divorce rate? Why are people splitting up? Why are people not holding true to their vows of declaring, I will be with you until death do us part? Well, one of the reasons is because we don't have a proper view of the roles of husbands and wives. And you say, Pastor, why are you talking about wives submitting their husbands? I thought this is Mother's Day. You're supposed to be honoring and exalting mom. What do you mean you have to submit to her? Well, look, this is God's word. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing bad. There's nothing evil. This isn't something that's, that should be looked at ever as being viewed as a negative thing. 
it's not a bad thing to submit yourself to your husband. If it's a bad thing, it wouldn't be in God's word. He wouldn't be telling you to do it. But sometimes it requires faith. If you don't understand why things are the way to do it, it just requires faith to trust. Well, God knows more than I do. So maybe I'll just try listening to God and let's just see how things go. Just the other day, I got an email question from somebody. I'm not going to go into the details about it. It doesn't really matter. But they're, just, they're asking a question about, about a certain situation with a husband and a wife. And I responded basically by saying, you know, I don't, I don't uh, give different advice based on the situation because the truth is the truth no matter what. I mean, it's, it's going to apply to everybody. And they brought up a, a certain situation about what the husband said in response to some argument that the husband and wife were having and everything else. And I was just like, well, you know, because the husband said something he shouldn't have said and it wasn't right and it was, you know, was kind of threatening or whatever. But my response was, and, and this isn't what you're going to hear from the world and this may be why they're asking the question. I don't know. And I'm not casting judgment on whoever asked the question. I don't know anything about them or whatever. You know, it's not, it's not important. But the world would, would have told this person, oh, she's got to get out of there. Oh, she, you, know, what, you know, that's the best thing to do. My response was, well, why, you know, why is she having some big argument with her husband? I don't know what it's all about. Didn't, didn't get any details. And I'm not saying you can't disagree with your spouse or you can't disagree with your husband. You can have disagreements. And we, we're human. We know there's going to be fights. I mean, it happens. It happens in every marriage, okay? So... We know it'll happen, but doesn't make it necessarily right either. If you're think of, think about it this way, should you be getting in arguments and fights with God? Should we just be going, God, I, you know, you're not right about this, and I, you know, I don't like the way you do this, and I, you know, would that be right? Would that be the right attitude to have towards the Lord? Well, when we look at Ephesians 5.22 and the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves on your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's the mindset that, that we need to have. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now keep in mind that again, this is, this is referring to everything in, in the, you know, the whole realm of God's authority structure. There's one area where I believe it'd be right for a wife to disobey her husband, and that's if her husband is telling the wife to do something that is completely contrary to God's word. We have to retain the, you know, the, the power structure we have God in the family, God, then the husband, then the wife, then the children, okay? No matter where you're at on that spectrum, God's authority trumps everybody's. So even if you're a child, let's say mom and dad are telling you to do something that is contrary to God's law, then the children would be right in obeying God rather than men. But be very careful with that, just in general, that you're not making up more excuses and more outs of saying, oh, well, this is the will of God for me to go and leave my husband and go, you know. No, 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 no. Be very careful with that and make sure that you are getting, you know, that, that what you're choosing to follow is, is clear and explicit and laid out very clearly from God's will. Because the husband's not only supposed to be this, the, in charge, but he's also the spiritual leader of the house as well. And the Bible says, you know, for the wives that keep silent in the church, if you don't understand something, if you, or if you have any questions, that you're supposed to ask your husband at home. That's what the Bible says. But let's keep reading here in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 25. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So again, a lot of detail going into the husband. And I'm not going to get into all of this because it's, I'm, I'm focusing on mothers. I'm focusing on wives this morning. But this is equally important. They're both important. If we're going to have a marriage that's going to last or a successful marriage, a marriage that's going to be honoring in God's sight, you would have the wife that is in submission to her husband and in, in submission as unto the Lord, the Bible says. But the husband then that loves the wife. See, what people hear, when you hear these days and what, and what critics will say, when they hear, oh, the wife is supposed to submit to their husband, the, the, the first thing that pops in her mind is ty tyranny. You know, like, oh, there's this tyrant and you're, you know, you're going to have this man that's just... You. But did you really marry someone that's just a total tyrant? I mean, that's, if you did, I'm sorry, but that, you know, that, <laughs> that's a bad mistake you may have made. But hopefully you married someone that loved you and the reason why you got married is because you love each other, right? And, you know, men aren't perfect. And women aren't perfect, but this is the way that God says, you know, you know the, the leader, the person in charge should love his wife so much that he's willing to die for her and treat her as his own body. So that as much as he would take care of himself, he's going to take care of her. And I'll tell you, when people are in the right roles, this works both ways, okay? It's going to help your marriage. So let's say neither person is in the right role. Let's say you have a situation where you have the wife just, just running the whole show at home and the husband who's just concern, more concerned about hanging out with his friends, watching sports and have nothing to do with his wife, okay? Not loving his wife, not caring for her. Maybe he doesn't even have a job. She's off at work. She's running the house and he's just sitting at home and hanging out with his friends and playing video games, right? Totally backwards household. Not going to be a good marriage. Not going to be a successful marriage. But let's just say you have one person in either end, whether it be the husband or the wife, decides to get right with God. You say, I'm going to fill my role. Instead of saying, they don't deserve for me to be submissive to them. Or, well, she doesn't deserve. She's always telling me what to do and nagging me and stuff. I why should I love her? Instead of having that type of an attitude, if you just submit yourself to God first and say, well, this is what my job is according to God. I'm going to do this. It's going to make it that much easier for the other person. And in a story I was given where a husband and wife were arguing and he said something he shouldn't have, it was kind of threatening. Well, what if that woman was just being really submissive and not getting in arguments and fights and, you know, causing the strife, even if she's right, but just saying, okay, I'll submit because that's what the Bible says. Okay, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do what you want me to do. Is there going to be an argument that's going to escalate then to the point of, of hearing threats from a husband? I don't think so. And in that situation, then guess what? The husband, when she continues to be submissive, to be a servant, to be ministering, to be helping, that love from the husband's going to grow. It will. Because he's going to see, how, how, how can you? You'd have to be like the, the, the coldest hearted person to not see what your wife is doing and, and the position she's putting herself in. To not have your heart grow warmer and, and, and get more love for your wife that way. And vice versa. You know, and, and then the husband should be taking more leadership and, and response. But let's say you have a wife that's, that's rebellious, wants to be in, you know, doing her own thing. Well, husbands, you love her anyways. Start taking control and taking charge. You got to do that. And that, that will, see, on this end, it's going to cause some strife. Because if you have a woman that wants to be in charge and a man that wants to be in charge, it's going to be a power struggle. But, Man, if you want to do what's right, you, you do have to be in charge, but you still have to just show and shower your wife with love so that you can show her that she can trust you 
with your decision making because of how much you love her. And a good leader isn't a leader that's one that's just always an iron fist. You could be firm, but not a, like a dictator or tyrant, right? You could be firm, but explain and talk to your wife like you love her because you should anyways, and, and show her that you can trust in me safely as much as you can trust in God, right? It's easy to submit to God's authority in our lives as men and women, knowing that we can trust the Lord in everything. When bad things come our way, I could still have peace. When I lose my job, I could still have peace knowing that, hey, God's going to take care of me. I know he will. I don't have a doubt about that. But we need, you know, as men, you need your wife to feel the same way about you. You, you need to show enough love to your wife and, and attention and care to her that she could be secure just knowing that, okay, he loves me so much. He may not be perfect, but I could trust him. I could trust him. I could let him lead. I could submit. In both situations, if you have at least one person doing their job, it's going to be better for the marriage as a whole. It's going to help the other person to come along in to, to kind of naturally fall into the position that God has for them. And this is, you know, you can't have two people in charge because what happens when there's a disagreement? You know, everything's great as long as you're in agreement. But not everyone, no husband and wife is going to agree on everything all the time. We, anyone who's married knows that. <laughs> married for any length of time, you know that there's, there's disagreements. There's, you know, of course, any two people in the world, husband and wife or not, I mean, you're, you're not going to agree on everything all the time. But that's why there has to be someone that just says, well, this is the, this is the decision. This is what's going on. We're not going to fight about this. We're not going to vote and have two people vote and one against one. What do you do? Who's the tiebreaker? Well, God says the husband's in charge. And that's just the way he did it. It's going to eliminate a lot of fighting, a lot of strife. It should. If we're doing what's right, it will. If we can put ourselves aside and our flesh aside, it will. Now, I said, you know, the, the, the role of a mother could be a hard job. And you know what? It can be a hard job to submit yourself. It's a hard, for all of us as humans, sometimes to submit to God. Sometimes it is hard. Because we have this flesh that wants us to sin. And maybe it's hard for the wife to, to submit herself unto her husband. It may not be easy, but it's what's right. Let's focus on doing what's right. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see the, the husband and wife's roles, but it's also related to Christ and the church. So the church and the authority structure here, of course, we have Jesus Christ is at the head. 1 Timothy chapter 3 outlines the two offices, biblical offices within the church. You know, I know there's a lot of churches today that have all kinds of different titles and everything else for different people, and that's fine. You know, I don't care... It doesn't matter to me, but we have to recognize who actually has, who God has designed to have positions of authority within the church. And that's the bishop and the deacon. And it's not the deacons that have authority over the bishop, by the way. That's backwards. We have many churches that have deacon-run churches where the deacons vote and can vote out the pastor and just vote out everyone else and that they're, they have the ultimate authority in, in the church. And that's not right. According to the Bible, the bishop is the one that's ruling and he uses that word rule in the house of God. They are the ruler. Again, Christ, of course, is the head, is the top, but then you have the bishop, then you have the deacons. And you can see even in the biblical example when you have elders, which is another word for bishop within a church, um, the deacons were, were ordained to help in these bigger churches. So after the day of Pentecost, you've got, you know, thousands added to the church. You have big churches in Jerusalem at that time. There's a lot of people congregating together. So there's a lot of needs that need to be met within the church. Well, if you've got one bishop or two bishops or whatever, you have, you have people in charge, you need help administering. So they ordained deacons. They weren't in charge of the church, 
But they definitely had a realm of authority and a ministry to, to work within the church. And these were men of God. These are people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. When those, the seven deacons were, were ordained to help with the daily ministration, with the needs of the widows, with just other things going on in the church, that was still, they still held a position of authority within the church. And, and the, the church members should honor and respect the authority they had. But then the bishop would be at the top, you know, kind of ruling over church. First Timothy chapter three, look at verse number four, given the qualifications for a bishop, the Bible says one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, gravity is a seriousness, you know, someone who's, who's in charge at their home. So a man that's running his house well, a man who, when he's, when he tells his children to do something, they listen to him. They respect him. And they don't just joke around and think dad's some big joke. If you can't run your own household, how in the world can you manage or run anybody else? But that's why the qualification is given. You have to rule your own house well, having his children's subjection with all gravity. Verse number five, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, I just want to point out and just, just make this note here that it uses the word rule, then it uses the words take care of. And those two go hand in hand. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13, because if this isn't clear enough to show that the bishop actually is ruling the church, we'll see it very clearly in Hebrews 13. When I rule my house, I'm in authority, I'm making decisions, but what am I doing? I'm taking care of my children. I'm taking care of my wife. I'm caring for them in the authority that I exercise in the decisions that I make ruling my house. And again, that word, that word ruling, again, it brings up the connotations of, of a tyrant. And, and it really puts people off. Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse number seven. The Bible says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. So this is talking about, hey, remember those that have the rule over you. Well, who would have the rule over you? Oh, it's those that are speaking unto you the word of God. They have the rule over you. And then in verse number 17, again, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? For they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for this is unprofitable for you. The ruler in the church is the bishop. And the bishop is the one who's speaking the word of God and who is watching for your souls. Who cares about you, the congregants, the church members, care about your souls, care about you being right with God, care about you making good decisions, care about you receiving the truth, so in ruling, that's the, you know, that same position, and it's similar with ruling a house. So um, you know, the authority structure in the church is, of course, Jesus at the top, bishops next in charge, then you have the deacon. Deacon does have some authority over the congregation. The, de the deacon can rule, but still falls under the authority of the bishop. Now, why am I going into all this detail about the church? Because in Ephesians 5, it, it likens husbands and wives to the church. So in the authority structure of the family, you're going to have the husband in charge, like the bishop is in charge of the church, and then you have the wife, which would be like kind of the authority of a deacon within the church, which is still subject to the bishop, but has rule over the rest, which, you know, and the wife would have rule over the children. In the home, God's the ultimate authority. You have the husband in charge, then the wife, and the wife can make laws because she has authority over the children. But the only time where that, that law would, be cut, would, would not stand is if the husband would say, no, that's not the way things are going to be here. And then mom would have to submit to that authority and say, okay, well, that's fine. And, you know, if, there's, if, there's, if this is happening frequently within a marriage where, you know, mom's getting frustrated because every time she says something, you know, the husband's coming in and saying, no, no, no then you know what needs to happen is that, that mom and dad need to get together 
And mommies understand more what the husband wants so that they could be in accord with each other because you don't want to have a bunch of disunity and the children just, just constantly hearing different things. Because it's going to be confusing for the children to say, well, I'm supposed to listen to mom and dad. And then you hear something from mom and you hear something else from dad and it's just this back and forth all the time. The unity needs to start. And that's why with, with management and, you know, men, you need to be able to recognize this and to be able to explain what you expect from your wife in, the, in that role and be clear on that because, you know, no one's a mind reader. You need to be up front and you need to have that stability for your children. Now, turn back if you would to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 10. I had another point in here, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip over that for sake of time. You can look it up later if you want. Numbers chapter 30, it just talks about a little bit more with husbands and wives' roles. If a wife makes a vow unto God, the, God outlines that the husband, if, if the husband hears that, he can disannul that vow. That's the authority that God has given within the home. You can look that up for yourself. I'm not going to read those passages for you. We're going to turn to Proverbs chapter 10 because I want to stay more now having gone through this whole structure, this family structure. Let's get more into mom's role and, and again, why we, why we honor and, and love moms and the roles that they, they do have and the job that they have because it is extremely important. It is not easy. Proverbs 10, verse number 1, the Bible says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. You have to turn there, but Proverbs 15, 20 says, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. Two verses that are saying very, very similar things. When the son turns out good, when the son is wise, that makes dad happy. That makes a glad father. Everything has worked out well. But when you have a foolish son, it says it's the heaviness of his mother. Now, that doesn't mean it's not also heaviness of the father, right? And it's not saying that it's not making the mom glad when the son's wise either. But the reason why it brings up the father versus the mother in these two situations is because it's pointing out kind of the responsibility of mom. Say, so, hey, when everything turns out well, mom's doing her job at home, she's raising a wise son, that's going to go all the way to the top and make dad happy too. But when the son's not turning out right and it's turning out to be a fool and making foolish decisions, well, that's kind of turning more to mom and saying, mom, you're not, you're not doing your job in raising your child because he's making all these foolish decisions because that's mom's job primarily to be raising their children and teaching them. She's responsible for the upbringing. Similar, turn if you would to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, we're going to see a very similar verse along the same lines. Proverbs 29, verse number 15. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And this is in conjunction with the disciplining, with the instructions. As the rod and reproof give wisdom. The Bible very clearly teaches in you know, what we call spanking as a form of punishment. That's what the rod is. The rod gives wisdom because the rod gives correction for for children's disobedience when they're, when they're, when they're falling out of line. It's going to give, it's going to teach a child and give them wisdom. But when mom is too busy, when mom doesn't want to deal with that, when mom just puts everything off and say, well, you just wait till your dad comes home. It's going to bring mom to shame. And you, you know, you might wonder, well, why aren't my kids respecting me? Moms don't fall into the trap of just letting dad take care of all the disciplining. Now, dad should be disciplining the kids as well. And there may be a time and a place where you're going to have to say, well, you're going to better wait till your dad, because you know, when the kids get into some, maybe some real serious problems, they may need to be disciplined by dad. I'm not saying there's never a time for that, 
But what you don't want to have happen is mom's never being the disciplinarian and it's always only dad. And dads, don't make it that way. Don't be the one that's only the, the authoritarian or the, you know, the, the one doling out the punishment because then you're going to be lopsided in the kid's eyes. Again, the kids need to learn to respect mom and respect dad, both, and be able to look at both and, and whatever either one says they're going to do. You should not have children that are just going to bypass mom all the time and go to dad. Now you're not leading effectively because then dad, why did, why did God even create you to have a wife to, to manage all the things in the household? You've got to be off working and focusing on those things while your wife is at home taking care of the kids and raising the family. And she needs to be able to handle that job without you just always being involved all the time and just making sure all the kids are, are punished. You know, no, mom needs to take care of that. And ladies, don't get too busy. Cause I, uh, <laughs> and, and I know this firsthand, especially having been out of work for a while and doing more things at home and spending even more time at home. It's a hard job, okay? I will recognize that and I'll be the first to admit, yes, the job that my wife has raising our children is not easy at all. There are a lot of things that need to be done at home and it requires a lot of time and it's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort and, you've, and you're getting torn into 20 different directions at once. It's not easy. But you cannot neglect your children and their upbringing and the disciplining that's required because you have cooking and cleaning and everything else to do. Keep the priority where it needs to be. And our priority is on people. The kids, your husband. Those are the priorities. Okay? Sometimes some of the other things, the tertiary things, the, the, the cleaning, and the, you know, it needs to be done. But don't put that above what really needs to be done and just leave the children just to themselves because it's gonna bring, ultimately it's going to bring you to shame. You may get that cleaning done quicker than that day, but over the long run, if you make that a pattern, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out and bite you in the end. And then it's going to bring, you know, you're going to be wishing, oh man, I wish I would have just said, forget that and, and given the proper discipline to my children. Uh, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 23. Oh, Proverbs 23. We'll look at verse number 23. The Bible says, Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. Raising wise children does not happen by accident. But look at what's you know, being promoted here is buy the truth, don't sell it, you know, do whatever you can to get the truth, get the wisdom, get the instruction, get the understanding. And this is directed at a son. This is directed at a child. And he's saying, if you can get, if you get smart, you get wise, you get instruction, then mom and dad are both going to be really happy. Why? Because that should be what's valued also in the home is that your children are going to be wise. They're going to have understanding. They're going to be taught. They're going to receive instruction. It requires a lot of teaching to raise wise children. It doesn't happen all by itself. It is work. And this is why we believe it is our God-given duty to teach our own children and to not outsource that to somebody else. We care about our children more than anyone else will. You as a mom care more about your children than any other person will. Nobody will have the same love for your child that, that, that you do. No one has that love. 
There, are, there may be many caring people out there, I'm sure, that care about other people's kids. But at the end of the day, no one is going to care for your kids the way that you do. I mean, even just think about education and teaching them. you got one person responsible for teaching 20, 30, 40 people. Well, you're only going to care so much. You, you, you only can care so much for an individual child. When you've got children struggling in different things, different kids have different needs, one person can only spread themselves so thin, no matter how good intention they are. But as a parent, you're going to make sure that your kid isn't falling through the cracks, that your kid isn't, you know, not getting what they need as far as receiving instruction and wisdom because you care about your kid more than anyone else will. Someone else is just going to be like, well, it's just too much for me to handle, so it is what it is. But it's a lot less likely for mom to have that same attitude with her own kid. Well, there's just too much for me to handle, so whatever. Hopefully you don't have that attitude with your kids. It's our, it's, God has given us the responsibility. When God gave you children, when he's blessed you with children, there comes responsibility with that. It is a great blessing. But God expects you then to raise them, to nurture them, to, to bring them up in the wisdom and the admonition of the Lord. It requires hard work. It requires dedication. You have to be getting up early. You're probably stay up late to make sure everything gets done. You have to be able to manage your time well. And it's never going to be perfect, but you can't give up. And then in verse number 26, the Bible says, My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. One of the best ways to teach your children is by example. Yes, they need to be receiving the word of God. They need to be receiving instruction. They need to be receiving, you know, their wisdom through teaching. But one of the best teaching tools is by example. And when you send your kids to be off with other people, they're going to be patterned after them and not patterned after you because they're not spending enough time with you. Whoever they're spending the most time with is who they're going to be patterned after. And this is human nature in general, even when it's not children. Now, children are much more impressionable than adults. But even adults put in different situations, like who you hang around with, who you work with, who you spend the most time with, you're going to find yourself being patterned after those people. It's the way that we're engineered just socially. And understanding that, that'll help maybe drive home the importance of your children being with you. You don't know what other people are like, but you know how you are like. And you also then will help keep you in check too. See, the mom that, that sends her children off just for all day long or whatever to be, to be taught by other people, and then your husband's off at work, where's your accountability now? Yeah, it may make your job easier. You could get, oh, I get the house clean, everything done, and, and now I've got time to spare. But when you've got kids around, you need to keep in mind, hey, they're watching me. And it's not, in a, you know, it's not like a, a 1984, they're watching me. It's, a, it's just a, I need to make sure that I'm doing what's right in the eyes of my kids because I want them to learn and to grow up right. And, and honestly, as a father even, you know, having children helps me not to take shortcuts, not to do things sloppily. Not, you know, when I know my children are watching me, that helps me to just to make sure I'm doing everything right. Because it's important, because they see what I do. And, and moms, it's, the same. it's even more important because they're spending more time with you to, to keep that level of accountability. And when you're teaching by example, then you can't expect your child to behave contrary to the way that you behave. Right? How, if, think about this. If you're ha are you having serious problems getting your, your children to have respect for you? Right? If you're having real problems with that, well, the first thing I would say is, or ask is, are you respecting your husband? Are they seeing a level of respect that you could have towards dad? Or maybe, maybe your children, are your children respecting dad? Maybe they're not. Maybe dad's not filling his role properly, but then they see mom berating dad. Mom, to, you know, what's that going to teach your kids? Oh, it's okay to just talk bad to dad then. 
Or maybe you're having problems getting your children to have respect for you. Are you leaving all the, the child to themselves? And not training them, not teaching them, not instructing them. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's busy. It's, a, it's, it's not an easy job. It's very difficult. And again, this is why we're honoring Mother's Day. Because these things are all extremely important. I'd even, I'm willing to even say this, that the, you know, it's not because we're denigrating women and we're holding women down. I think the job of a mother is even more important than the physical job that a father has going out in the world and providing for the family because you have more influence on the future. You're having that influence on your children. Dad, yeah, dad needs to make sure ends meet. He's going out, he's making sure money's coming in, enough to feed the family and everything else. He's providing, which is, of course, important. It needs to happen. But that supplies the physical needs. Mom is taking care of all of the rest of the needs, the emotional needs, the wisdom, the guidance, the instruction, which is going to lead them for the rest of their lives. And the husbands are going out and working at their job, working at the office. Those are day-to-day -day needs. Mom's job is, is impacting, it, it extends way farther, way farther, farther than life through the children. That is an important role. That is one worth waking up every morning and put, and you know, moms, they don't get days off like dads do. <laughs> Dad, dads could get vacation time or, you know, time off work or whatever, PTO, right? Paid time off. You know what happens when mom's sick? Mom still needs to get up. Mouths still need to be fed. You know, diapers need to be changed. Kids need to be instructed. It's, you know, these things still happen. The clock doesn't stop when mom's not having a good day. It's difficult. And dads respect that. Appreciate that. Love your wife. Ask her what's going on. Make sure she knows that you do love her because sometimes, sometimes there's days where you're going to think like, all the kids hate me. Why are they causing all these messes? I can't get anything done. And they need to hear and feel that love from you when you get home to bring back some sanity to, <laughs> to their day because it's not easy. And I've been learning this even more and more the more time I've been spending at home. It's not always easy. Mothers are held in high regard, very, very valuable. And mothers don't get discouraged. You know, we went over a lot of things that, that may be difficult, but don't get discouraged. It's worth it. It's really worth it in the end. There's great rewards for your dedication. Just understand that it happens a little bit later, especially when you have younger children. Rewards are going to come later. I think you really fully realize how much it was worth it when you see your son or your daughter as a godly individual. You see your son that has wisdom. You see your daughter that's living for God and, and a good person doing what's right. That is worth it. It's hard getting to that point. But as with pretty much everything in the Christian life, it's not about the immediate return. It's not about what you get right away. It's an investment. It's about the future. You know, we're, we're trying to rack up Spiritual rewards, heavenly rewards, not things we get tomorrow, not things we're going to get today. We're working towards something greater. Raising children is working towards something greater. Every day it's a toil, it's a struggle, but it's all worth it in the end. Now, there's a lot of small rewards along the way to help keep you going. Enjoy those. Enjoy the cuteness. The kids, when they're young, the, the unconditional love that they'll have towards you. The little things, the little kisses and cuddles, and so that keeps you going. You know, my, my one-year-old can, can wreak havoc now because he's walking around, pulling things out of the garbage, throwing things in the toilet, and doing all this stuff. But when he drives you mad, all you got to do is just tickle him, and you hear that little tiny giggle. It makes things a lot better. It's great. Enjoy that. Kids are awesome, okay? It, but it's a lot of work. And, and enjoy the small rewards along the way, but, but don't lose sight of the end goal and, and the, the, what truly is important with your children. Last place I'll have you look at, look at Proverbs 31. 
I'm going a little bit longer than I was intending on this morning. Proverbs 31, passage about the virtuous woman. It's the last chapter in Proverbs. And ladies especially, I, I recommend wives, mothers to memorize this passage. It's a great passage. It's a great, you know, just, just life passage to just live by. Say, I want to be virtuous. I want to do what's right. Study Proverbs 31 regularly. Keep it in your heart. We're not going to go through all of it by any means. L read it later on this afternoon. But right near the end, look at verse number 28. The Bible says, Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Isn't that where you'd like to have in, in your family, in your marriage, where your kids, your kids rise up and they, and they bless you. They call you, oh, bless mom. Mom's great. Your husband is praising you. This is a great place to be. This is, the, this is one of the good results that you want to you have. And maybe that's not the way it is in your house now. We want it to be that way. Let's jump up to verse number 25. Now, obviously, you can read the whole chapter and get everything in context. But let's look at verse number 25 because we're just going to give a brief summary of, of how you can have things this way in your house. Proverbs 25, strength and honor are her clothing. You have to be strong. There's a lot of work involved, a lot of work. Strength and honor. Honor you know, is going to come by doing what's right and being that good example. You're clothed with strength and honor. You're putting that on every day. And she shall rejoice in time to come. Your rejoicing comes in the future. Keep that in mind. Verse 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. And that's, that is something, I think that's another reason why God intended for women to raise children over men, because the kindness that moms have really surpasses the kindness that I think dads have, especially when it comes to dealing with the children. We're designed differently. Thank God for that. Thank God that men are not women and women are not men, no matter what the world's trying to, to, to force people into and get people to, to think about. There, there is a good, I'm sure every woman in here loves that, that men are not women, and every man in here loves that women are not men. I don't want to be married to a man. <laughs> no way, not a chance. I love women and I'm sure women should have the same feelings towards men. That, that we are different for very good reasons, and we love the differences, and we exalt the differences. But let's keep ourselves in, in God's, um, God's will here in, in the way that he designs things. So opening up your mouth of wisdom. So ladies, it's important to know God's word, to be able to teach that wisdom to your children. You open your mouth with wisdom. Your tongue is in the law of kindness. Verse 27, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. If there's one thing to take away from this sermon for being a mom, being a good mom, don't eat the bread of idleness. Idle means you're not doing anything. You know what idleness is? I don't have my phone. My phone's recording. Huh? What? Oh, oh you're hungry? Uh, hold on a second. Flipping through your phone, sitting on Facebook. That's idleness. If that describes your day, you're not going to rejoice in time to come. It is silly. Words of wisdom by a little child. It's very, ch it's, it's very silly. But it's happening, I think, more and more and more. And we need to, re you know, ladies resist that urge. Men resist that urge, you know, everyone. But, but you know, you want to be a virtuous woman, don't eat the bread of idleness. Look well to the ways of your household. Look well to, to what needs to be done. Teach the wisdom. Have in your tongue the law of kindness. Kindness goes a long way, too. You said, again, with leadership, ladies, you're leading your children. Men, you're leading your household. We need to be able to, to lead by example and lead in a way where you're not just, I mean, you shouldn't just be berating people in order to get them to listen to you and follow you. That's not the way to lead. Keep the law of kindness. Now, children, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to close the sermon with, with a message to children. Okay? Children, you should be loving your mom. 
It was Mother's Day. We respect our mothers. We took putting time aside to just recognize and say, Mom, we love you. We care about you. We should be telling them that every day. But, but we are making a point to make sure that we're going to honor and respect our moms. Here's a couple of verses from Proverbs for the children to listen up. Okay? So take this. This is God's word. Proverbs 23, 22 says, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. So this goes for even older children, not younger children, but older children. Don't despise mom when she's old. Don't neglect mom when she's old. Don't forget about mom when she's old. You take care of mom took care of you all those years growing up. Make sure she's taken care of. Make sure that she's loved. Proverbs 20, 20, whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. That is wicked, wicked to curse. You know what curse means? You know, what's blessing? God bless you. That's a good thing. That's a blessing. What's a curse? How about, probably one of the worst curses would be like, go to hell. Hell is a curse. Hell is a bad curse. That's an eternal curse. Those are words that should never, ever come out of the mouth of a child towards their parents, ever. The Bible says God's serious about that. You don't curse your father. You know, that was actually a death sentence in God's law. That's how serious it is. You need to respect mom and dad. You respect the work that they do. You respect the food that they put on your table. You respect what they do for you. You don't complain. Oh, I didn't like this. You know, I love your mom. She's taking care of you. And then finally in Proverbs 30, this should be a, this, probably this, one of the scariest ones of all. Proverbs 30, verse number 17. The Bible says, The eye that mocketh his father. So what is mocking means making fun of. When you're just making fun of dad, it means you're not respecting him. You're mocking what he says. And despiseth to obey his mother. So that means you hate disobeying what mom, I wish I didn't have to obey mom, and you hate it. You despise doing what your mom says to do. The Bible says, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out and the young eagle shall eat it. It's talking about your eye. So about birds eating out your eyes when you're mocking your dad. That doesn't sound very fun, does it? I know I wouldn't want to have eagles poking at my eye. <laughs> it's trying to be a good illustration. The Bible's trying to teach you really bad things will happen when you're not respecting your parents and obeying them. Okay, love your mom. Everyone, love your mothers. They're, they put forth a lot of work for you. The job is not easy. We love all about God's word, everything that God has given us, our roles, our functions. Mothers, love your job as a mother. Love your children. Love your husbands. And, and, the more that you can get in line with what the Bible teaches, the better things will be in the short term and the long term. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us. God, help us to not make your instructions difficult. They're, they're really, really easily understood. Sometimes they're harder to put into practice. As long as we're in this sinful flesh, it, it's not quite as easy as it, as it looks sometimes, but God, I pray that you would please give, uh, give the moms especially comfort and peace as they, as they raise their children. Give them guidance and wisdom, dear Lord, that they could teach wisdom unto their own children. God, I pray that you please help the husbands, the fathers to love their wives as they should and to also recognize the important job that mothers have and to, uh, and to love them for it and to Show them that love to help get them through that job. Dear God, help us all to learn more and to study your word on a daily basis that we could be more conformed to the truth and to the image of your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.